everyone. Welcome to today's session. And uh, the focus today is on pediatric palliative care. You are welcome to introduce yourself in the chat. Now, uh, issues of pediatric palliative care are a bit complex because there are many issues that affect children, including issues of communication, decision-making. We need to rely a lot on their parents and guardians to give us decisions about care. Communicating with children comes with a lot of challenges. So this afternoon, we are going to look at uh, a case presentation, and uh, we are also going to have a presentation on pediatric palliative care. So I would like to introduce Professor Julia Downing to give us a presentation on pediatric palliative care. She's currently the Chief Executive Officer of ICPCN, the International Children's Palliative Care Network. She has worked in palliative care for over 29 years with a lot of experience pioneering palliative care services for adults and children in East Africa, especially in Uganda, in Africa, in Eastern Europe. And she's, she has a vast experience in research and teaching in palliative care. Welcome, Professor Julia. You can start sharing your screen. Please let us meet our microphone. We are not even presenting. Yeah, kindly mute your microphones. Thank you. Over to you, Professor Julia. Thank you, Esther. And uh, it's good to be here and to see you all. When I look at the list of participants, some of you I know well and others are new to me. And I can see that we have a range of participants, some who work in palliative care and others who are working more in the humanitarian setting. And so I'm going to talk to you uh, this afternoon for, um, about providing palliative care for children in vulnerable, fragile, and conflict-affected um, settings. Um, so as I start, just to say, as well as the Chief Executive of the International Children's Palliative Care Network, I'm an honorary professor at Makerere University in Uganda, and I, I have uh, lived and worked in Uganda for over 20 years, so hopefully I have some um, understanding of the East African context. So as we start, uh, this picture of these two little children, and uh, I think Zippy's on the call, and I think these were two children uh, that Zippy looked after. And it just reminds me, this picture, that as we're thinking about palliative care for children, our aim is that they will have life right up until the time that they die. We want to make sure that they have a good quality of life and that where possible they are able to um, live their lives as children. So let's just think about uh, what we're going to look at in the next 20 minutes. So I'm going to talk about children's palliative care and I'm going to talk about some of the principles of children's palliative care. And hopefully we can then apply those principles to how we can improve the quality of life for children and their families in humanitarian settings. Um, I'll be talking about the principles and we'll think about how do those principles apply to vulnerable, fragile and conflict affected areas. Um, how do we integrate children's palliative care into the care that we provide? And then I'll look at some of the challenges that we as humanitarian healthcare workers will face in providing children's palliative care. So I think to start with, and I know some of you are just attending this session, some of you are um, attending the whole series of um, sessions on uh, palliative care. And so you'll be very familiar with the definition of palliative care. But I want us just to think about the definition of palliative care for children. Um, and this is from the World Health Organization. And importantly, it talks about it being the active total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit. It talks about beginning from diagnosis and continuing on regardless of whether uh, an individual has treatment directed at the disease or not. And it talks about the physical, psychological, and social. And importantly for us, in the humanitarian context, it says that palliative care should be implemented wherever the child is, 
whether that be in a hospital, in a clinic, in a refugee settlement, whether it be a child who's currently um, sheltering from bombs in an underground um, basement. Wherever that child is, we need to look at how best we can provide palliative care. And we know that palliative care provides relief from pain and other distressing symptoms. It affirms life and enhances quality of life, and that's what we're looking at, isn't it? How do we make sure that these children and their families have a good and the best possible quality of life? And I think within the humanitarian setting, that is even more challenging um, than in, in a normal setting. It's about providing support um, to help the children. It's also about helping the family cope during the child's illness and then into bereavement. And again, within the, a fragile setting, within a humanitarian context, this can be challenging, as often uh, the children and their families might be transient if they're coming through perhaps a refugee settlement. Um, we might not be there to support them during the bereavement process. We might not be there to support them from um, diagnosis onwards. And so we need to think about how best we can apply these principles within um, the vulnerable, fragile and conflict settings. Importantly, it uses a team approach, and I think that is key for us within uh, the vulnerable, fragile and conflict-affected settings, because we need to work with the team who are there, whether that be other people from M MSF or the Red Cross or um, one of the other aid agencies, whether that be doctors, nurses, um, clinical officers, counsellors, whoever is in that team, um, we need to be working closely with them. And we've already said it's applicable wherever the child needs care. So just a, a quick thing, can you put in, your, in the chat, uh, when do you think is the best time for palliative care to begin for a child with a life-threatening disease? When there are no more curative treatment options available, when the child has less than six months to live, when the family can no longer afford treatment, or when the child is diagnosed with a life-threatening disease? If you can put A, B, C or D in the chat and we can see your thoughts and I can see some of you have already done that. Yes, and it's great to see most of you are putting in D. I think nearly everybody's putting in D. And that is so important for us. We need to be thinking about providing palliative care from when the child is diagnosed with a life-threatening disease. But again, within a humanitarian setting, this might be challenging. We might not have seen the child uh, when they were first diagnosed. Uh, they might have been receiving treatment elsewhere. We might not get to see the child until um, towards the end of life. We might not even get to see the child until the last few days, depending on the setting in which we're working. And so we need to think about how we can apply these, um, our principles to, um, to a fragile um, setting. So let's just think about who are the children that need palliative care. And uh, I've used some of Megan's slides here. Um, so obviously children living with a progressive condition a condition where there's going to be ongoing deterioration of their health and or their abilities. Uh, children living with a life-threatening condition and also children with significant pain and um, or other symptoms which palliative care can address. So a range of children needing care. And if we look at the Global Atlas for um, palliative care, we can see that there's a wide range of conditions uh, that children have who need palliative care. And interestingly, uh, premature birth and birth trauma and congenital malformations is quite a large group. And again, we see this um, often within fragile and vulnerable settings that, for example, women might well go into labor early on. And so there might be more children who are born prematurely. They might have given birth in not ideal circumstances, and so uh, the impact of birth trauma. Also, we know HIV, um, and also the, the issue of malnutrition. And again, these are two 
key issues for us working within the East African context and working within the um, vulnerable, fragile and conflict affected areas. If we look at um, some work done in the UK by Together for Short Lives, they've identified four groups of children. Uh, the first are those with life-threatening conditions for which curative treatment may be feasible, but it might fail, or else for many of our children in, uh, in humanitarian settings, they might not have access to that treatment. Conditions where premature death is inevitable, progressive conditions without curative treatment options, and then irreversible but non-progressive conditions causing severe disability, leading to susceptibility to health complications and likelihood of premature death. And again, working within the fragile and vulnerable settings, uh, these children um, are more likely to uh, become susceptible to these health complications, maybe due to um, uh, at lack of, of food, maybe due to the fact that they've had to travel and they've had to um, to to move uh, regularly, and so these are four groups of children who might need access to palliative care. And I think one of the key things for us um, in children's palliative care, and I'm sure you've heard this before, it's about hoping for the best but planning for the worst. And this is so important. Um, if children say, for example, they have cancer, if they do have access to curative chemotherapy, then we're hoping for the best. But we're also aware that many don't have access. For many, the treatment might not work. And so we're also preparing for the worst. And I think this is a, a good example because this shows how the two go hand in hand. It's not a matter of curative treatment or palliative care, but the two very much go hand in hand. So let's just think of some of the principles of palliative care in children. And as we look at these, we'll think about how we relate these to the humanitarian setting. So firstly, it's across the continuum of care, and we've mentioned this um, from diagnosis onwards, across the variety of care settings, whether they're in hospital, whether they're being cared for in a refugee settlement, whether they're um, in their own home, whatever their setting, we need to be trying to provide palliative care. Um, and again, it's important that it's not seen as a last resort, but an essential part of the care that we give. This is a, what's known as the bow tie model, and this shows the parallel planning process um, for within palliative care. So we have the process of hoping for the best and planning for managing the disease or curing the disease, but at the same time, we have palliative care. We are managing their pain and other symptoms. And as the disease management um, and curative options become less, then the palliative care provision hopefully will become more. So it's this parallel planning. And that is really important in the contexts in which we work. And if we have children who are perhaps moving from a, um, from a volatile situation perhaps to a refugee settlement, uh, we, we might not be there during that disease management process. It might be that they started that, maybe they started chemotherapy, but because of the situation they're in, they find themselves no longer having access to it. So we need to be thinking what is available, and for many of our children, not much might be available. Um, how can we make sure that they have access to treatment if it's available, but also that we are ensuring that they are getting good quality palliative care. And obviously the place of care is important. This is one of the refugee settlements up in northern Uganda. How do we make sure that we provide uh, care for the children wherever they are? Pain and symptom management is an important issue. And one of our challenges that we'll talk about later is perhaps that we don't have access to the medicines that we need. And importantly, it's not just about um, pain and symptom management related to their treatment, so for example, uh, related to their HIV or, or a tumour, but also 
related to their treatment as well. So what about procedural pain? How do we manage their pain if we're sticking needles into them? Do we manage their pain? What are the options available for us? And we need to be thinking about both pharmacological and non-pharmacological um, options. And this is really important, and this will come up in the case in a minute. Um, but particularly within the settings where we are, where maybe they don't have a regular supply of certain medication. How can we manage their pain and their symptoms? And of course, we need to think about the physical and psychological. And that leads us on to the need for emotional support for all children, regardless of their age. And of course, for many of the children that we're caring for, if they have um, come from a uh, conflict-affected area, um, if they've had to leave home, they've already got those fears, they've already got those anxieties, they're already in a strange place. So that just adds to the emotional needs, both of the child and of their families. Um, and we need to be, as, as Dr. Esther was saying earlier, we need to be open uh, with our communication and honest with our communication. But one of the challenges might well be that in a society where decisions are made collectively, where the decisions are made perhaps by family members, those family members might not be there with them. Um, if they have been fleeing from a, a war, a war zone or, or a, a difficult area, then maybe they're only there with their mother and not with their mother and father, and yet their father is the decision maker. So these are all key principles, and, and somehow they can be a bit more challenging within the humanitarian context. And of course, the social issues. If they've moved and they're perhaps staying in a refugee settlement, if they've left all their peers, if they're no longer at school, um, if they are staying in a, an environment where they don't speak the local language, this just goes on to exacerbate the feelings of loneliness and isolation, and maybe even the stigma and impact on the families. Um, so, so important that we try and provide uh, then with some social support, we try and help them to try and find some form of social support within the context they're in. And whilst schooling is so important for many children, it might not be possible, it might not be available within the context um, in which they are living. Spiritual issues are key, and we know this particularly in East Africa, uh, where the existential issues are so important. Um, but it is often hard for us to talk to children about some of the issues, and particularly when they are already traumatized because of the setting in which they're living. But some of the useful concepts are issues around hope, uh, transcendence, meaning, acceptance, connectedness, and relatedness. But trying to encourage the children and their families to talk about some of these spiritual issues and get support as appropriate. We've mentioned end-of-life care, and sadly, sometimes children will come into refugee settlements right at the end of life. How can we support them? How can we ensure that those last few days or hours are the best that they can be? And how can we do that within the context in which we are working? Um, it's really important not to forget the siblings, and even more so in this context when the siblings might be feeling lonely and isolated and traumatized by what is happening uh, generally and then traumatized around the loss of, uh, of their sibling. So thinking about what best we can do, how best we can provide care within the situation they are in. And that's similar with grief and bereavement, such an important aspect of care. And yet, how do we provide ongoing bereavement support when perhaps the, the families are, are moving around and, and are transient? Um, how do we support them in their grief? And this grief might be on top of other grief from, um, from coming from a, a, perhaps a war, in fact, a war um, environment, perhaps having lost other members of the family, perhaps being separated from family members. So whilst we would like to provide them with, with bereavement counselling, how can we do that within the settings where they are living? Again, we've mentioned communication so key. We need to be open and honest, um, but we need to be um, uh, aware of what they know, of what the family know, of what the children know. Um, and we need to try and develop 
trust. But again, for many of the families that we're caring for, they have lost trust. They don't know how to trust in people. They fear. Um, so how do we develop that trust? And if we are just seeing them, perhaps in the last few days, how do we really try and help them to trust us? The families are so important, and yet we've already mentioned for many they will be separated from family members. They might already have lost family members within the situation they are in. So how do we support them and how do we support the families? And a challenge as well is it's so important for many of our families that, they're, that they are buried in their, their family um, burials, in their family, in their village, in their home village. And many will be far, far from their home village. And this is no longer possible. Many will have to bury their loved ones, their children, perhaps where they are in a refugee settlement, knowing that they will be moved on and might not be able to visit the grave regularly. So challenges within the setting that we are in. And of course, financial issues. Many of the families we'll be caring for are already uh, in poverty, are already struggling financially. Um, how do we get the support for them that they need? How do they get um, access to, to the medicines that they need? Now, for many, hopefully, we'll be able to provide those free of charge, but that isn't always the case. And what happens if they're moving on? Um, so the challenge of financial issues is great. And then we mentioned earlier the importance of teamwork and working together, making sure that the child and their family are core members of that team, are at the centre of the care that we give. Now, ideally, we would be providing shared care with an oncologist or the paediatrician. Um, if they're in a, um, a refugee settlement, maybe it's with those at the clinic or the local hospital, but really trying to work uh, with the volunteers, if there are any volunteers within the, the refugee settlement, working with whoever is around to try and support these families. So if we think about uh, these principles, and I, I'm going to end in a minute, but if we think about these principles, um, they can be integrated into vulnerable, fragile and conflict settings. These are principles. And I like to say that the ph philosophy and principles of children's palliative care can be applied wherever we are. Now, there are models, there are uh, materials to help us. Uh, the conceptual module of palliative care from the World Health Organization looks at what is needed to provide a palliative care service. And how can we apply that to vulnerable, fragile and conflict settings? And then, of course, you've got the field manual for palliative care and humanitarian crisis, uh, the WHO handbook, the SPHERE handbook. Um, there's indicators. There's some work done by MSF. And I know there's some people from MSF on the call here. Um, guidelines on palliative care in um, humanitarian settings. So all these can help us to apply those principles to vulnerable, fragile, and conflict settings. There's also been some recent um, standards developed uh, called the GO PAPAX standards. And these are standards for pediatric palliative care. And they have a specific section in that looking at providing children's palliative care in humanitarian emergencies, in humanitarian settings. And these are just some of the standards. And there's more detail that can be provided um, in those standards. And I can provide Erin with that paper if people would like access to it. But there are challenges, and we know there are challenges. And just as I close, let's just think of some of those challenges. There is a lack of recognition of the need for children's palliative care. And actually, often, in acute emergency settings, um, palliative care is not necessarily going to be the first priority. But within refugee settlements, and as things settle down, it's really important that the children who need palliative care have access to it. Uh, there's generally a lack of policies and specifically within the humanitarian context. Um, traditionally, palliative care hasn't been integrated into humanitarian health care, although with the interest now from organisations such as MSF with the SPHERE handbook, the SPHERE guidelines with the WHO, this is becoming more common. However, there's a lack of access to education, treatment, trained professionals, medications, and again, in the case study that we're going to be looking at in a minute, there's, there's a lack of access to some of the medicines, such as morphine, that we might need. A lack of resources, and if we need to prioritise our resources, what do we prioritise them in? 
end-of-life care I've mentioned, decision-making, um, really challenging uh, in many of the contexts we work in terms of decision-making and how do we support families in that. We have a mobile population. Now, in some refugee settlements, people will be there, families will be there for a while, but others, they are more transient. And wherever the child and their family is, we need to be looking at how we can provide palliative care. So a mobile population, a lack of records. They probably, the last thing they have thought of when fleeing uh, somewhere is to bring all their medical records. Now, they might have some with them, but they might not. Um, so uh, that could be a challenge. Palliative care not being a priority. Um, the lack of understanding of the need for, for palliative care. The tra an already traumatised population, they're isolated, they might be stigmatised, um, they are traumatised from having to leave their homes or whatever the situation might be from the war, whatever their, their situation, uh, there is often trauma there. And so trying to provide palliative care on top of um, already existing trauma adds another dimension for us and the fear and other emotional issues and the lack of trust um, how can we provide care working within that environment um, I've talked about the fact that after death and bereavement support might be challenging um, and memory making can be difficult you know often we like to try and make um, handprints or footprints or whatever it might be um, and that can be difficult within this context so there are challenges, but uh, what I've learned within the East African community is that we're very resourceful. And so there are ways for us to be resourceful and to overcome those challenges. And just finally, this is, um, you might well have seen this already, but this is a map looking at morphine equivalent. And you can see that many of the areas where we are um, caring for people, in, for children in vulnerable, fragile and conflict-affected settings, don't have access to morphine equivalents, to the medications that we need. You can see Uganda, and I think Kenya's there somewhere as well, um, but there's not a lot else of um, Africa there. So we don't have access to all the medicines that we need. That's a challenge, but it doesn't stop us. So in um, providing children's palliative care in vulnerable, fragile and conflict situations, we want to help the children and their families achieve the best possible quality of life. We want to relieve their suffering, body, mind and spirit. We want to care for them with competence and compassion. And we want to respectfully accompany the child and their family on their journey as much as we can to make sure that all of the children living in vulnerable, fragile and conflict-afflicted settings can have access to palliative care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Julia, for that enlightening discussion presentation. Now we are moving to the Q&A session. Uh, anyone with a question or comment, please feel free to raise your hand. Then I will unmute and you can be able to ask your questions. You can also type in the chat if you are unable to unmute or raise your hand. Yes. Sorry, let me just see, sorry. Must be mine. Uh, Ross Gahire, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Professor Julie, for a nice presentation. Thanks, uh, good morning, good evening, everybody. I have a question on, uh, on a slide where you were, there were two doors, one for hope and another one not for hope. Kindly, would you mind if you go through it again? Ah. There was one which has like open kids and whatever hope and not you expect two things okay so let me show you that one again <laughs> this one here hang on let me share my screen again this this one here i think you were talking about rose so so, so these two doors were about hoping for the best but planning for the worst so, for example, if you have a child who has cancer, 
then um, you, they would be hopefully having access to chemotherapy, which might provide a cure. But we know as well that within our settings, at least 80% of children come with advanced disease. And so for many of them, the chemotherapy is not going to provide a cure. And so we need to be planning and preparing uh, for the worst. So it's about parallel planning, Rose. It's about um, looking at treatment and curative options, but at the same time ensuring that we are providing palliative care and that we are planning for all eventualities. Hope that helps. Since we are planning for uh, the two and of course for this. Yeah, we, we, we are aware that, that it could be either. And so we are, we are planning, okay. um, we are thinking ahead. Okay, thanks, Professor. Tamuro, Jim, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for the wonderful session. My name is Jim Tamuro. I'm a fifth year medical student at Makere University, a finalist, Bachelor's of Medicine and Surgery. So I'm inquiring whether we have uh, some palliative care center for children in Uganda. Thank you. Um, Erin, I don't know, I couldn't hear that. Can you, or Erin or Esther, can you repeat the question for me, please? Uh, Jim, please repeat your question. I did not catch the last bit either. I think I was saying is there are uh, palliative care centers for children. Oh, in, in Uganda, yes. I mean, there's, well, the palliative, the, the palliative care team at Malago Hospital and um, the, the key hospitals in, in Kampala provide palliative care for children. Hospice Africa Uganda provide palliative care for children. Malthme Uganda provides uh, palliative care for children. So there are quite a few um, uh, in Kampala and around Kampala, and then many uh, of the palliative care teams around the country will provide palliative care for children as well. Um, if, if you want more information, uh, you could contact the Palliative Care Association of Uganda and they can uh, let you know where you can get, uh, where children can receive palliative care. Can I also, so, as, um, Esther, yes. can I just answer, I just see there's one about play. Play is the work yes, of children. Yes. How should we provide play opportunities in a humanitarian situation? You know what, the thing I, I love about um, play is that you can play in, in anywhere um, and uh, uh, I've seen children with you know with with no toys they don't need toys but just playing perhaps on the ground and I was playing noughts and crosses with it with some children just in the dirt on the side um, that there are different ways that we can provide play and we can encourage play and I think it's a good way of of enabling children to express their feelings as well, um, particularly the siblings. Um, uh, and, and often as you're playing with a child, uh, you can be having, um, talking with them about things as well and they're often more likely to open up. So just use whatever, whatever we have available uh, to, to play and children are very inventive and uh, I love it. They can see things in, in uh, objects and, that I can't. Um, and it, it's good fun. So yes, encourage play wherever. Mohangi Salam, please ask your question. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, mine is to, I think I'm asking about uh, could children who are, who are like being affected by war also be under palliative care? And uh, also sometimes you find others maybe that have been through very bad domestic violence or abuse by either the loss of their parents and uh, maybe they are attached to a family that has been hostile to them. Do we grade that as rehabilitation or palliative care or could they benefit from the palliative care or something help me understand between palliative care and rehabilitation in that regard. Thank you. Okay, so um, if you think about at the, at the start of the, um, of the session, we looked at the, the types of children who needed palliative care. So those with progressive conditions, life-limiting and life-threatening conditions. Um, now, in, in terms of, I think your first question was, 
children um, impacted by war. Well, sadly, in war situations, children get hurt, children um, get very traumatised. Um, you will have children who are needing palliative care who are find themselves within a war situation. So I, th I think in, in, a, in a war situation, we, just, we are providing, in an acute war situation, we provide the care that we can to those children who need it. So I'm not going to, if I'm an expert in pain management, I'm not going to turn around and say to one child, I'll, I'll look after your pain because you've got a life-threatening condition, but the next child hasn't, but they're still in pain. In that war situation, I will use my skills um, for any child that needs it. Um, in terms of, it, there's a, um, sadly a number of children who have been abused, there'll be a number of children who are in difficult situations, um, who haven't got a life-limiting or life-threatening condition, but who will need support and counselling. Um, and that might not be through the palliative care team, but it might also be through a counsellor um, on the palliative care team, depending on, on uh, the situation and the environment. Um, so certainly I know in, in several of the um, refugee settlements where I, I've worked, there's been counsellors and they have provided counselling for the children. And if we need them to provide support within the palliative care context, then we ask them to. Um, so within it, it's it's just seeing what support and what care they they need and referring to make sure they get that care that is needed. Okay, thank you so much. Another one is still, how do we categorize pain? There is emotional pain, physical pain. So I'm wondering, does palliative care take care for only physical pain? No palliative care, like we talk about total pain, which is physical, psychological, social, and spiritual. And that's why those, four, and cultural as well. And if you add in, um, if we're thinking about children in um, fragile, uh, vulnerable, and conflict-affected um, areas, there will be the pain from, from that trauma as well. Um, and so within palliative care, it's really important that we look at the total pain that the child and their family are experiencing. Um, and, and they're all very much interlinked um, as well. So by relieving and supporting a child in terms of psychological issues, then that might help with their physical pain as well. So it's about seeing the child um, in their total context, uh, not just physical, um, but the psychological, social, spiritual, etc. Thank you okay, so much. We, we have some comments in the chat. Um, many participants are appreciating the good presentation. And uh, there are a few comments that it's important for us to think of siblings when we are taking care of children. And also for healthcare workers to, to rethink about uh, procedural pain. And uh, the final question is about measures to ensure that children from hard to rich areas can access palliative care. Professor Julia, are there any measures that we can use to ensure accessibility? For example, um, Ada says in countries like Uganda, palliative care centers in, are in the capital city and these people are already having financial challenges. Okay, so in countries like Uganda, uh, there are palliative care programs across the country. Um, the Palliative Care Association of Uganda has a list of all the different programs. And one of the key things that we're trying to do in Uganda, in Kenya, in, in Rwanda, in, in a wide range of East African countries is to make sure that children, regardless of where they live, and adults, regardless of where they live within the country, can access palliative care. So, for example, I think Vicky Opio spoke um, a couple of times ago on, on this um, this uh, session, and uh, she's helping to develop um, palliative care within the refugee settlements. So there are people across um, Uganda, across Kenya, who are trying to make sure that children can access palliative care. Now, we're not there yet. Um, if we were there yet, then, then we wouldn't be needing perhaps sessions like this. Um, so it's an ongoing challenge, uh, but that's something that we need to be working working for together is to ensure that children and adults wherever they live across the country can access palliative care and there are good networks between palliative care providers that help with that 
and I think there's also a, a comment there about siblings, and I, I think that's the same the same thing. It's it's actually how do we make sure that the children and their families, including the siblings, get the care that they need, uh, regardless of where they live. Okay, I think we'll take uh, this as the final question for this session. Is it possible to provide palliative care in countries like Congo, where curative care is a challenge? It's definitely possible to provide palliative care in countries like DRC. Um, in fact, I was talking to someone just yesterday um, providing palliative care in Aru, um, and I know of other um, palliative care programs uh, that are um, in place in, in the DRC. Uh, it's not easy. Um, the DRC is a very big country, uh, spread apart by um, it, different terrain. Uh, we know that there's challenges in terms of the humanitarian context in the DRC. Um, so it's not easy, but it is possible. Um, and we just need to try and... Um, Liz Gwither from South Africa always used to say, we might not have a lot of resources, but we are very resourceful. And we need to be resourceful and innovative and think outside the box as we try and uh, provide access to palliative care for children and their families. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Julia, for that uh, wonderful presentation and discussion. Now we would like to move to our case presentation. And I would like to welcome uh, Erin Das. She's a palliative care trained nurse who has been working in this field for over 14 years with a great passion for improving accessibility of palliative care. She has worked in very many countries and um, this include Canada, Tanzania, USA, Papua New Guinea, and she's now in Kenya, where she's working with the um, Paragua Cancer Support Trust and the Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association, where she's a faculty in the Palliative Care Nurse Leadership Program. So she's going to give us a case presentation after which we'll go to breakout rooms to have a discussion. Welcome, Erin. Hey everyone, it's uh, it's great to see you all here. Thank you for being really attentive. Um, as more questions and stuff come in the chat, I'll just encourage the faculty to try to answer. I think we're not going to have a chance to answer all the questions um, out loud. Uh, but again, if there's any faculty on the call that can answer specific questions, they're really, really good questions. So please keep asking, uh, and we'll try and answer as many of them as we can. So today we're going to be talking about uh, a case of a of a child. Um, and any faculty that's been given co-host capabilities, if you can just watch the if people are unmuting during the call. Thanks. All right. So the questions that I want you to remember or think of during this case presentation are the following. What is the best approach to managing an acute, possibly reversible deterioration in a child with an incurable condition? The next question is how could we better manage this child's breathlessness, especially since morphine was not available at the time? Next, how could we have supported this family's preference to take the child home given her dependence on oxygen? And what is the best approach when a family requests to see a traditional healer? And the final question is, what other suggestions uh, can be given to improve the care for this child and family? So these are the questions that we're gonna talk about and think about in our discussion uh, groups after. Um, but now I want to present the case to you this afternoon. So the patient is a five-year-old female with a congenital heart disease. Uh, diagnosed on April 24th, 2021. And the disease was transposition of the great arteries. Her other diagnoses were severe acute malnutrition plus bronchiolitis plus septic shock. So in terms of her treatment uh, timeline, she was presenting on April 24th. She was admitted to the facility for fever, severe respiratory distress and diarrhea. Her family sought treatment at multiple other hospitals, uh, but when she was at the facility, her murmur, uh, she had a murmur in the aortic region and hepatomegaly plus three centimeters. She was 
showing chest in drawing, wheezing, severe hypoventilation bilaterally. And she was started on oxygen 10 liters per minute by reservoir mass. She was given the following medications, ceftriaxone, dexamethasone, salbutamol, and maintenance IV fluid. Then on April 28, her condition slowly improved. She was an inpatient and our team was able to wean oxygen to two liters by nasal cannula, but the child continued to have moderate respiratory distress. The POCUS revealed the, um, the defect, the TGA, and it was confirmed by telemedicine. Feeding was done by a feeding uh, NG tube with formula one and was slowly increased each day. So May 2nd, a few days later, the child was sleeping more but opening her eyes. She continued to have the moderate respiratory distress and oxygen dependence, but overall, it seemed that her condition was improving. Currently, there is no morphine uh, available in our project, but prescriptions were sent to the capital city. The family did agree to stay in the hospital awaiting the morphine prescription. And a decision was made on May 2nd that they were not gonna offer CPR in the event of a cardiorespiratory arrest, unsure about her life expectancy at this point. So then on May 4th, so just two days later, there was a sudden deterioration. She began with the fever again, severe respiratory distress, desaturation, CRT of um, more than three seconds, fever again, tachypnea, elevated white blood count. And the team at this point suspected potential reversible septic shock. Um, fluids were given and ceftriaxone and cloxacillin was restarted. And her oxygen uh, had to be increased to 14 liters. By May 6th, so again, just two days after that, consultation was made with palliative care advisors and the um, mission pharmacist. The morphine, unfortunately, still had not arrived, so she was started on IV tramadol, um, uh, Q6 hourly, but unfortunately, there was no significant improvement noted. There was a plan, plan was documented in her file to leave the oxygen in place, but not to escalate um, her care in case she deteriorated any further. She had generalized tonic convulsions that lasted three minutes and ended before any medication was able to be given. And the plan to treat aggressively with diazepam if any further signs of convulsions or agitations occurred. Unfortunately, on May 7th, she had a generalized tonic convulsion, which was treated with diazepam. So she continued with the, um, the seizure. And on May 8th, the child, uh, the, the little girl, was reacting only to painful stimuli. On May 9th, so just the day after that, the family um, requested discharge. And that was the last, uh, the last visit that we had with her. In terms of her pain and symptoms, she was breathless. And this was the biggest concern of her mother. So we had the ability to give tramadol um, 0 0.5 milligrams per kg per dose every six hours. Sorry for the typo. Um, and we increased it uh, on May 9th to 0 0.75 milligrams per kg per dose. We considered diazepam, but it wasn't um, given for this indication of breathlessness. And then we did positioning and chest physiotherapy. For her fever, uh, this continued to be a problem throughout her, her time at the hospital um, and her acute deterioration on May um, 4th. So we continued with scheduled paracetamol and ibuprofen. The agitation and irritability um, were, we, again, we considered diazepam, but we hadn't given this, um, we haven't, but wasn't given for this indication. For her convulsions, we gave the diazepam. And in terms of pain, um, we were inquiring whether it could have been the phlebitis or skin breakdown, um, possibly due to the IV. And uh, we provided skin care and again, paracetamol and ibuprofen for that. In terms of nursing issues, um, 
I hadn't mentioned it earlier, but on May 6, she developed IV phlebitis. Her IV access became progressively more difficult um, to do uh, and to access new IV sites due to her edema. On May 7, she developed skin breakdown in her perianal um, area due to frequent loose stools of, of the diarrhea. So it did require frequent hygiene care and zinc oxide, and it, it did improve slowly. In terms of her psychosocial and family concerns, the mother and the parental grandparents were very involved in her care. The father, unfortunately, was never at her bedside, and it was unclear to us as to the reason. She did have one older male sibling, and they were a refugee family in the community. The primary concerns of the, the family were, again, the child's breathlessness. Um, they wanted to know what was the cause of her disease and why there was no improvement and why we weren't referring the patient somewhere else. Her mother was really, really shocked and emotional after we initially disclosed uh, her prognosis in the situation. Initially, her family was asking to go back home, um, but they agreed to stay to better manage the child's symptoms uh, in the facility. On the day of her discharge, uh, the family said that they had other children at home that really needed care and that she had been admitted for too long. Um, she had three sessions with our mental health counselor um, and the palliative care coordinator visited her on a daily basis. We did, we were able to allow for open visitation during the time that she was in the facility. Um, and we just let the watchman or the guard know that any visitor was allowed to come and visit with her. In terms of her spiritual concerns, this uh, patient and family were of Muslim faith and it was very important to them. And the family wanted to visit a traditional healer. They, the visit um, was actually facilitated by our unit, uh, by the palliative care coordinator and the traditional healer um, at that point agreed not to give for anything orally by mouth. And they performed a zarfuk for the baby. On the day of her discharge, uh, it was right before Eid ul Fitur on May 13th. And the family said it was very important for them that they wanted to celebrate this festival together. So in terms of communication, what does the patient and family know about the disease? This is oftentimes where we find ourselves in palliative care and when we uh, continue to need to focus on communication. So on April 24th, her prognosis was shared and the permission for no further CPR was taken. On May 2nd, we continued with counseling by the palliative care uh, focal point, the mental health counselor and the coordinator, as well as the nurse uh, manager. The mother really wanted to go home, but the grandmother felt that they should stay. So questions about her diagnosis and her prognosis were explained by a local speaking palliative care focal point using drawings, um, and this was really effective. The ability to directly communicate facilitated a therapeutic rapport with the family. One of our first attempts to truly uh, offer interdisciplinary family team meetings with this case. Initially, the family didn't understand the reason to stay if the condition was incurable, but after counseling, they decided it was a good idea to stay to manage her symptoms. It required repeated explanation and sometimes frustration on the lack of improvement um, the family was voicing. Repeated requests for referrals and for MSF to pay for her expensive surgical repairs were coming from the family. Um, but at the end of the day, the family did understand the child had a hole in her heart. So as we moved to collaboration and partnerships, uh, we were trying to think of how we each um, partner with what we're doing and how we're caring for the patient. So the teams that were involved in the care were the palliative care coordinator and the health promotion team, the mental health counselor, as well as the medical team. So the treating physician uh, and the focal point. The nurses were heavily involved in the team, the health assistants, medical translators, as well as the nursing manager. We were able to access a special feature with MSF through telemedicine and palliative care referrals. And we did consider referral to home-based care, um, but it wasn't possible in this region uh, because the child was oxygen dependent. 
So a brief summary on this case. She was a five-month-old girl with transposition of the great arteries. She had bronchiolitis and severe acute malnutrition. The primary concerns were related to breathlessness, oxygen dependency, and the family's desire to go home. The case was complicated by a lack of access to morphine in the project or in the region. And the child did develop septic shock on day 11 of her admission. So as we, um, as we just review the case summary, and as we think about the questions, we are going to head off into breakout rooms. And, and we're going to take some time to, to think and, and talk as a smaller group um, through some of these questions. So I will put these questions on the chat so you can see the questions during your discussion. But I'll just review them again. What do you think is the best approach to managing an acute deterioration in a child with an incurable condition? So possibly that could be related to her septic shock. Um, how could we best manage the child's breathlessness, especially since morphine was not available at the time? How could we have supported the family's preference to take her home um, given her dependence on oxygen, which often is very difficult to deliver at home or impossible in certain settings. And what is the best approach when a family requests to see a traditional healer? And then you can end your time if there was any further suggestions on how to improve the care for this child. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and hopefully you guys have had a chance to really think about this case and even you may even uh, have been thinking about an, another child that you were caring for. So as we go into our breakout rooms now, um, I would like uh, each of the faculty just to help the group facilitate a discussion. If you have any specific questions, please don't hesitate to ask them in the breakout rooms. And we're actually gonna spend about 20 minutes um, faculty in the breakout rooms, just so we can have a really good discussion. Um, and then we'll spend the last uh, 10 minutes if there was anything that we needed to cover as a large group. So I'm gonna start the breakout rooms now, um, and then I'll add the rest of the people. So I hope, uh, I hope your chats go well. I just got kicked out, Erin. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah, I don't know why. Um, okay, let me find you. Um, uh, how do I do this? Do you remember what room number you were in? No, I don't. Um, it's not letting me add you to room three yet. Let me try and add you to another room and I'll put you back in nope. room three. Don't worry.
it doesn't <laughs> like me in room three. It kicked me out. Oh. <laughs> That's so bizarre. Um... They're, they're busy chatting. I, I went in. I Are heard they? Things, so. Oh, this is so weird. Okay, let me try. Um... I'm back. <laughs> That's so weird. Oh, Don't worry. Um, there I isn't a faculty in room six. So do you want to actually z log out of your Zoom and then come back? Or Shall I try? Maybe, because we still have, like, the people are going to stay on the call till 5.30 or, like, to half past the hour. Okay, let me see if I can come back in then. So I'll try and add you to room six. Okay.
Welcome back. Let's wait for the other groups to join us. Then we can wind up the session. Erin, are all the groups back? Uh, I think people are coming back, yeah. Um, So I believe we've enjoyed the discussions in the breakout rooms. Uh, we are coming almost to the end of the session. If anyone has any question or any issue that you feel is burning and we need to address, please let us know. David says that they did not have enough time for discussion in their group. It looks like the questions were many. <laughs> well, Yes, Erin, do you have any comments or announcements before I wind up the meeting? Um, Hello? We have a few more minutes. I don't know if Dr. Ali or David or Dr. Esther, Ninga or Professor Julia or yourself, Dr. Esther wanted to comment or summarize a few things that were shared. I think I'll summarize last. We can start with David. David says their time was short. <laughs> David, do you have any comments? A uh, quick one. Uh, this case scenario, uh, we agree, is a very difficult case and with many, many challenges. But uh, uh, among us, the discussions that we had, uh, it, it's about the goals of care. Uh, focusing our activities to the child's uh, well-being based on the child's situation or presentation and what the child and especially the family would wish to have eh? so that we avoid a futile kind of interventions, uh, but supporting the family in a holistic way. But yeah, it's a difficult case scenario. Thank you. <laughs> Esther? Uh, so in addition to what David has highlighted, our group also thought about the role of community support for the patient and the family. So maybe they were feeling like the child is a burden. It would be important to find out why they wanted to go home. Um, is there someone in the community um, who would be able to uh, maybe also be a voice of reason or even support them if they decide they don't want medical management, even as they decide to go home, um, there would be the need of counseling them on the consequences of um, not going on with therapy in the facility so that they know what they are getting into. And then another important uh, idea was to see if they wanted to create memories with their, with their child for the time they have had left, because we know it was not a curable Curate, uh, curative um, type of care for her. So um, maybe photos with the families and something that even if the child was to pass on, the family would still have good memories left with them uh, of, of their loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Zippy. Hello, madam. Hello. Uh, Dr. Napula, I'm driving. Uh, can, can I request uh, Tan? Tan, Tan oh, can you? No problem, no problem. It's okay. Tan can actually summarize it. You did a lot of talking. Sorry. All right. Okay. Uh, Erin? Yeah, I, uh, I think 
So this is one of the first times we've had a longer discussion, and this is what we hope to in the future continue with the course so that we have time during our lectures to, to learn new information, but then we also want to hear from each one of you. So I am really sorry, it sounded like a few groups had some people that were unmuting and there was lots of background noise. Um, so I am sorry for that. I think we just need to take into consideration each person in the on the team that's trying to learn. Um, and I would encourage you with this case to think about, um, Sorry, to think about this case with your colleagues, um, maybe over a tea or something like that and, and talk about the issues um, with someone that you work with um, to continue the conversation. As we move forward, um, we will share the presentations with you. We'll uh, share the recordings as well. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone who joined this open CME. We, uh, we're really glad that you did join us. The course is an ongoing course. It runs for 11 weeks. And if you are interested in joining the regular sessions that happen on a weekly basis, please don't hesitate to reach out and email us at our email, which is PC for palliative care, humanitarian, echo at gmail.com. I've uh, shared it on the chat and I can share it again. Uh, and we'll be most likely running this course again in a few months once we've finished our first course. So um, if you're interested in attending all of the sessions, we would uh, encourage you to, to reach out to us. A really, really big thank you to Professor Julia Downing and to Dr. Eskenafula, who um, really ran the program so smoothly today. Um, and I, I think we couldn't keep up with all the questions. There's so many good questions. Um, and it's really great to see each one of you here. I think a big part of learning is being willing to ask questions when we don't know. Um, so thank you so much for being vulnerable with us as a group today. And I hope you have a really great, um, a really great week. And we'll see you again on Tuesday for those that are in the normal course. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have bye, a everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Good day. Good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.